say to that person again, say, I'm a winner. Tell that person, winning is what I do. Tell that person, I always win. Hallelujah. All right, we're talking about the art of winning, and this is part two. Let's read from the book of 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 to 5. 1 John chapter 5 from verse 4 to 5. It says, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor, did you get that? And that person, ask that person, did you get that? Ask the person, are you in church? Tell the person the message has started already. Let me read it again. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. You need to pay attention to this because we're going to come back to it. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. Would you say one more time, I am an overcomer. Say, I am not afraid of obstacles. I am not afraid of challenges. Whatever it is, I overcome. Whatever it is, I overcome. You need to understand, the absence of challenges is not what makes you know that God is with you. As a matter of fact, if you are traveling and you don't conflict with the devil, the two of you may be traveling in the same direction. Opposition is not proof that God's favor is not on you. If there is nothing to overcome, why would you be an overcomer? Hallelujah. If you, there is nothing to conquer, why should you be called more than a conqueror? Okay, so we are not afraid of, I mean, we are not afraid of obstacles. We are not afraid of challenges. When they come, we overcome. Hallelujah. Last week Sunday, I, I shared with you what I describe as the four primary laws of victory. Four primary laws of victory. And I want to go back there so that we can continue from where we stopped. I told you four of them last week. I said, recognize the partnership. From Joshua chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. I said, recognize the partnership. God says, if you will set your foot, I would give you the land. If you would take it, I will give you the land. Number two, I told you that there is a place for your promise. Not every place is your place. Part time, there's a location that is yours. Don't labor in another man's field. And I told you, number three, somebody is on your property. God said to them, your territory shall be, and he described it from this place to that place, and then God said to them, the Hittite country. There is somebody there already. For most of us listening to me, what you desire, somebody else is doing it. Are you getting this? Guys listening to me, there's a sister you're interested in, and she's considering somebody else. There's somebody on your property. For somebody listening to me right now, your wife is dating somebody else right now. Your husband is dating somebody else right now. Are you getting it? For some people, the person is not dating anybody but preoccupied by life. So which one do you want? Human being on your property or the devil on your property? The person cannot even see his way through to think of getting married right now. Until that issue is resolved. The person is not thinking straight. Are you getting this? You want positions, somebody else is occupying it. You want a job. Listen, there is always vacancy in every organization. The reason why somebody else is occupying your position is because they don't know you yet. I'm telling you the truth. Vacancy is not, they are looking for somebody. Vacancy is, I can do it better and it's my place and the job belongs to me. They need to know I am alive. They need to know I am available. Some of us, they know you, but they don't know you are available. Because there's somebody on your property. But the last principle is very, very important. Verse 5, God said to Joshua, God said, nobody will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Is that not something? No man, that's what the Bible says, no man will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. But just before Joshua says to himself, oh, I'm, a, I'm the big deal, God said, it's not about you, it's about me. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Listen to that. No man will be able to stand up against you 
all the day of your life. Now, principle number three and principle number four are very, very important. There's somebody on my property. There's somebody in my space. The moment I want to begin to engage people, I must be conscious of the fact that it's not about me. If not, I will measure my strength against their strength. There are two ways this can work. Sometimes you underestimate opposition because you are seeing a man. And then sometimes you underestimate your capacity because you are looking at yourself from a human perspective. Did you get that now? So Goliath looked at David and in his mind, he is a boy. He has no weapon. Say to your neighbor, big mistakes are. Are you getting this? For some of you listening to me right now, the reason why they are going to fail in fighting with you is because they are going to underestimate you. Goliath said, you come against me with sticks. Hello? And sometimes when you look at your stick, you don't get into the fight. You can see the two sides of what I'm sharing with you right now. When you look at the person on your property and you see what they have and what you have, you don't know nobody, you don't have any connections, you feel I'm not up to this fight, I can't engage this kind of people. Goliath said, you come against me with sticks. The Bible said, and he cursed him in the name of his own gods. David said, you made a mistake. I did not come against you with sticks. I come in the name of the Lord Almighty. That's like saying, taking all the superpowers in the world, put them together and multiply them by 100. Now, if you don't have that revelation, you didn't say amen. See, because when Moses said, who should I say sent me? He said, tell them, I am that I am. In other words, you can't capture me. You can't describe me. I manifest part time what you can handle. I manifest part time what you need. So when David said, I have come in the name of the Lord Almighty. In other words, whatever this battle requires. Hallelujah. Whatever this battle requires, I have come in the name of the Lord Almighty. As you go back to work tomorrow, as you face challenges, always remember, it's not about me. I am not here in my own name. I'm not here to represent myself. I have come in the name of the Lord Almighty. Go back to work and let that be at the back of your mind. Go back to your business and let that be at the back of your mind. I'm not here on my own. I have come in the name of the Lord Almighty. And he said, as I was with Moses. In other words, the testimony of Moses is my prophecy. It's not about the giftedness of Moses. It's not about how favored Moses was. It's not about the ancestry of Moses. It's not about the pedigree of Moses. It's about the God who was with Moses. And that same God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what he did with Moses, he will do with me. What he did for Moses, he will do for me. What he did through Moses, he will do through me. Because he is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. Hallelujah. Now say that to your neighbor for me. Say somebody's on your property. But you are not alone. Say it again. Say somebody's on your property. But you are not alone. Tell that person you are going in the name of the Lord Almighty. Now that's just recapping last week. This is today's message. Force is necessary for achievement. Okay? And that's where we start from today. Force is necessary for achievement. You know, the Bible talked to us about Abraham when Lot was kidnapped. And the Bible said Abraham took 318 men. These were servants who were born in his house and trained in his house. I said, Papa Abraham, why did you have to do training? Why did you have military training for servants in your house? He said, Shego, force is the language of achievers. Are you listening to me? Force is the language of achievers. You need to understand that Abraham lived, okay, way back in those times where the, the strongest man is king. And please, you need to understand, in our own time too, the strongest man is king, but I'll describe that to you later. So you see, Abraham understood, if I'm going to, let me help you understand what I'm saying. In those days, for you to have something, you look at it, you like it. If you are stronger than the person who currently occupies it, you take it from him. That's it. So if you don't want your property to be taken, you have to defend your property. And how is Abraham going to defend his investment, defend his business, is to have guys in his house who can defend themselves. The quality of training Abraham gave his guys was as such that they could fight kings. And all he had was running a business. Okay, because it takes force. Okay, it takes force to achieve. It takes force to achieve. I'm going to talk specifically to most of us. We are still young. Okay, and please, you need to get this. It takes force to take off. It takes force to take off. You're just newly married. You're just starting out your life. Listen, if you are below 50 listening to me, it takes force. 
Some of us are working a job right now and, and you need to move to your own business or you need to go to another job. It takes force to take off. Let your neighbor understand what I'm saying. Tell the person, pastor preached the message a couple of weeks ago. Do you have a copy of it? Tell the person it is titled, Don't Settle. Listen. Because even at your next level, if you settle, it will be difficult to take off. And that's what happens to a lot of people. You've been afraid. Will I ever make it? Will it work? Will I ever get married? And then you get a job, you get a car, you get married, you get some kids, and then you settle. And when it's time for God to shift you to the next level, God finds it difficult to move you because you settled. In recent time, all my messages are connected. If you listen to the Thursday message, you would realize that you've got to be flexible. See, but it's difficult for people who have settled to be flexible. And a lot of times, the opportunities that would shift you in life come as surprises. They come as interruptions. Imagine if Mary had 21 days to go and pray about birthing Jesus. For some of us, it would take God over 40 days to convince you. Don't abuse Peter. It took a few hours. We wouldn't know Peter but for that he preached the first message to the Gentiles. To that complete change of direction came as an interruption in his life. But thank God he was flexible enough. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. See, let me say this. For most of us listening to me, the things you have planned for 2019 are not enough to take you to where God is taking you to. So God would allow you to go ahead with your plan, but in the course of the year, God will give you surprise opportunities if you are flexible, one, two, if you have been training for it. At the end of the message, I'm going to talk to everybody about the overflow, okay, the extra space we just acquired and the plan we have for it. The opportunity came on Monday. We sealed it on Tuesday. You know the reason why? It's just extra space, a total of about 151 square meters. Before then, what I'd been thinking about is buildings, is land. I've been thinking of thousands of square meters in my head. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. What I think about regularly is how we're going to get this massive piece of land, okay, in the Koi or Leki area to build church. So by the time somebody came with 151 square meters, it was not difficult for it to fit because, you see, my heart at that point was larger than that. That's where flexibility comes from, big dreams. Do you understand what I'm saying? Big dreams. If you're saving up to buy a car for 28 million, and somebody tells you the same car is available for 15 million. Changing your mind to buy it will not be a problem. But if you've been saving up to pay rent of 240,000, they now tell you there is a better house beside that one you were checking out, but it's just like 350. You will notice you will go and pray about it. And a lot of times it's while you are thinking about it. Let me think, let me pray, let me. The opportunity passes you by because you were not flexible at that moment. And you did not have margin in your life. I'm preaching Thursday's message because you were not there now. Many of us don't have margin in our lives, in your time, in your finances. Some of us listening to me, in your emotional bank account, there's no margin. The people can't come. The people that should shift your life, there's no space in your connectors. Did you get that? Listen, at every point in time, everybody has a limited number of important people you can accommodate in your life. At every point in time. So if you're not careful, some people who have the potential of shifting your destiny will come into your life, but there will be no space for them because you did not leave space. There's no margin. Do you understand? Opportunities that can change your life will come. There's no money because there was no margin in your finances. For some of us, we live in perpetual deficit. And it's not because money is not enough. It's because our management is poor. Do you understand what I'm saying? No matter how much you earn, there must be something kept aside. The volume of what you can keep aside determines the magnitude of what God can send into your life as a surprise opportunity. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. See, I, I, I knew this about preaching and teaching. So before I left the university, I had about 20 messages I never preached. Before because I knew a chance was going to come. An opportunity was going to come. When your big opportunity comes, what have you prepared for that opportunity? Are you getting this? What are you There is no topic you want to ask me to preach about now that I don't have material on. Because from 2009 till date, every message I have preached is properly organized and filed on my system. And I have a backup hard drive. And I've divided them into different topics. Purpose, faith, maturity. Different topics. Because when the opportunity comes, I don't need to use the armor of Saul. It is the stone that I have tested. So there's got to be margin. 
There's got to be margin in your life. If not, it's your next level. There was a time it was your next level, but now it has become your norm. And you can't take us from there because there's, you need force and you don't have that force. I'm going to explain what I'm trying to say to you. To achieve your dreams and to fulfill your purpose, you have to contend with gravity and resistance. I'm using those words to describe something I need you to understand and I would explain myself to you. Somebody say gravity. gravity. Say resistance. One more time. Say gravity. gravity. Say resistance. Now listen to this. To achieve your dreams and to fulfill your purpose, you always have to, or you will always have to contend with gravity and resistance. This is what I'm saying. When you move from one level to the other, that new level becomes, oh, the new level, after some time it becomes normal. For you to shift to a higher level there, you will contend with gravity at that level. When you get to the next level, when you settle, if you allow yourself to settle, when it's time to move, you still will have to contend with gravity. So what is gravity? Or what do I mean in the context of this message by gravity? Gravity is factors within you that are pulling you down. This has nothing to do with your neighbor, has nothing to do with opposition, has nothing to do with the devil. This is you. Things about you, okay, that are pulling you down. I'll give you a few examples. Bad habits, faulty thinking patterns, unhealthy relationships. Now watch this one. Consequences of bad choices from your past. Nobody but you knows I'm dealing with this and they are holding you back. They don't, want you to, they don't want you to go to the next level. It's amazing how some of us have acquired taste. And that acquired taste is now what is keeping you from prospering. There was a time you, you knew how to read books. And then you moved to the next level. Now you can afford cable TV. And now you watch more TV than reading books. God has to now deliver you from TV now to take you to the next level. Because really successful people, they are always on TV. Much more than they watch TV. They, they, see, we are, t t tell your neighbor, TV is in our lives. So we all have relationship with TV. But there's a difference. Some are on it. Some are watching it. The ones that are on it are always more prosperous than the ones watching it. Go to the cinema, the same thing. Some are on the screen, some are on the queue. The ones on the screen are always more prosperous than the ones on the queue. Ask your neighbor, where do you belong? When you go to the cinema, do you go there to check how much tickets they've sold? Or you go there to check which new movie has been released? And for some people, it's gravity. There was a time you couldn't afford it. It's the, blessing of, it's the, it's the burden of prosperity. God shifts you to a new level and now you acquire taste. Some of us, we develop these bad habits after we prospered. Bad habits. For some people, you see, when your dream is very small, you will, you will mess opportunities up. When your dream for yourself is very, very small, just like Esau, you will trivialize your opportunities. You will not come into the future. You will be dealing with the consequences of bad choices you made in the past. You will not tell everybody God has not answered my prayer. It's now very bad when you are dealing with consequences and you still have not changed your mind. Somebody has rejected you. Somebody has walked out of your life or you have lost a job or you have lost an opportunity and the kind of mindset that brought you into that trouble, you still have not changed it but you are praying for God to bring a fresh opportunity and God in his goodness will bring. But the same thing will happen again. It is gravity. Faulty thinking patterns. There's nothing that gets at me. Like when I face or deal, interface with believers with faulty thinking. They can't be helped. They can't be helped. Let me say this to you. The things that would help you the most in your life, it's just like Elijah said to that widow, you would have to go to your house, you would have to shut the door. Your greatest miracle is going to happen behind closed doors. Let me come close. Your greatest miracles would happen between your ears. I'm telling you the truth. The greatest thing that God wants to do in your life is going to happen between your ears. It's your thinking changing. That woman said to herself, if I touch the hem of his garment, what people are saying to you is not important as what you are saying to yourself. If I touch the hem, it's think, is that thinking? If I touch the hem of his garment. The Syrophoenician woman, the same thing. Jesus said to her, I mean, this is Jesus rejecting somebody. Divine rejection. It is not proper to take what belongs to the children and give it to the dogs. Some people listening to me right now, it's at that point of offense that you are till now. You got offended. You remember Naman the Syrian? He said, I thought. Now that's the issue. I thought he was going to come out and call on his God. You don't know his God. Though. You don't have his anointing. 
But you have an idea exactly how it is. Amazing. We see that on social media every time. People who've never darkened the door of a church, but who know exactly how men of God should run churches. But when people are clueless as to how to solve other people's problems, they become commentators. I mean, of their own problem, they become commentators on other people's problems. I thought he was going to come out and call on his God and wave his hand over the spot. Are there no better rivers for me to go and bathe? Who told you that bathing in the river is the key to your healing? You should have, if you knew, you should have done it. Amen? You should have done it. Are we getting this? The servant said, see, at that moment, the thinking of the servant was better than his own thinking. The servant said, what if he said you should do something difficult? Would you not have done it? Somebody listening to me, you don't have it yet, but your attitude is qualified for getting it. She was a slave, but her thinking was straight. The same thing, the servant of Saul. Let's not just go back. There is a prophet in this city. Let us go and inquire of the prophet. I'm saying so many things without saying much this morning. That sometimes the kind of thinking you need for your next level might not be with you. But if you have enough honor for the people around you, there's wisdom around. Let's go to the man of God and inquire of him. The man, Saul said, I don't have money. Think about that. How did you come on this journey? I don't think he didn't have money. He must have had issues sowing seed. Because think about it. His father was rich now. They were well to do. They were on a three day or thereabout journey. How would you not carry supply? But he's thinking. I don't spend my money on those kind of things. So he said, I don't have money. The servant said, I have money. So as long as I'm not spending my money, let's go. Whose destiny was at stake? His own. And that's gravity. Of course, you know how his story ended? He became king. But he couldn't bring about a change of mind. The same things that have been battling with him were the same things that undermined his kingship. He was a pleaser of men. Saul would rather have people say about me he's a good person than be a good person. I digress. If you're listening to me right now and you are, you are used to making excuses, repent. Because it requires the same intelligence. It's just thinking that is messed up. And for so many people, your blessing is hanging, but gravity will not let you go. Unhealthy relationships. Blood is thicker than water, have you? Spirit is thicker than blood. Purpose is thicker than spirit. Do you know what that means? If we are family, I relate with you to the degree to which you align to my purpose. If we go to the same church, I align with you or I relate with you to the degree to which you are aligned to my purpose. Don't have people in your life just because we came from the same village or we came from the same womb. Cain killed Abel. They came from the same womb. Say, say, say to your neighbor, it's not enough. Tell the person that you are my brother, that my brother, that you are my sister, is not enough. Tell that person that we go to the same church, is not enough. It's got to be purpose. Are we getting this? And listen, and relationships expire. Oh, are you listening to me this morning? Relationships expire. People don't understand. Relationships expire. If you're like some of our mothers, when the neighbors brought cake and she rationed it, how many people had a mother like mine? She just doesn't want you to eat everything together. Then she keeps it. Four days later, it's the same cake. You cut it, you begin to see cobweb. It was good three days ago. I don't know if you understand. There are relationships like that. As you're running, you see, I, I was bothered at the point in my life. I had to meet my pastor and talk. I told him about, look, there are people in my life. We've been friends for years. I said, I don't understand. Sometimes we, we conflict now because when I say something, it's as if I'm speaking a different language. He told me, he said, Shagu, you are taking your growth for granted. And there's so many of us like that. The reason why you can't travel fast is because you are not traveling light, because you are still trying to go with people who don't even want to go where you're going. Do you understand what I'm saying? They don't want to go away. There's nothing wrong with where you're going and there's nothing wrong with not going to where you're going. But your journey is your journey. It's because don't turn around and judge them. Don't judge, tell your neighbor, don't judge me. Tell the person, God didn't call us together. Tell the person, your calling is your calling. But well, listen, but if you have to go, go! Amen? If you have to go, go! If not, the people that used to be important in your life will now become gravity. They pull you down. 
There's something called the crab theory. If you put one crab in an open bucket, it's likely to escape. The moment you put more than two, it's going nowhere. Because when one crab is trying to climb out, the other one will pull it down. When you are with people, I taught you that last week. When you are with people that can only be happy when they pull you down, you are in the wrong company. They are happy for you as long as your miracle is smaller than their own. John, have you met people like that before? Even when you are talking trouble, they want bigger trouble. So can you imagine, the guy did this to me, he did that to me, he said, ah, your own is small. If you know what, switch it, you're talking about you bought this bag. Man, if you see the other one I bought, they are only happy when they are better than you. Check out. Check out. Anybody that cannot be happy for you, just full stop. Don't mess up my testimony with an explanation. So I'm like, congratulations. Eh, but ah, are you sure you'll be able to afford What's your own? If it is congratulations, it's congratulations. I'm they will just look for something. So are you sure? Are you? Ah, hmm, hmm, man. Hmm. Ladies, listen to me. Stop taking advice, relationship advice from people who are not in a relationship. Hello. Say, ah, congrats. Eh? You guys have big dates, Abby. Mm, be careful. Mm. This man, ask her, where's your own? Don't take advice about men from somebody who does not have a man. If you don't want what I have, don't take my advice. Don't explain away their miserable, I mean, their miserable life and then take advice from them. It's gravity. They don't mean bad, but nobody can help you beyond where they've been to. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if somebody is not happily married, the person cannot counsel you to happiness. They don't know what you're talking about. Now you understand what I mean by that. We go to the same church. Because what was preached to us was preached to them. But what they had did not profit. Them. We heard it at the same time. You know, sometimes I interface with some of my church members. They make me feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Because as I'm talking to them, as I'm dealing with them, I'm like, did this one hear that message I preached just last week? Just last week. Then not long ago, I was preaching. Most of the people that were listening to me were on the edge of their seats. I was animated. I was, and then somebody was sleeping. Hello? What is the chance of that person fulfilling the word? When we said that, those that heard, it did not profit because it was how about the person that did not heard. They didn't hear you slept. And you know the kind of sleep that can distract the man of God? The person slept, slept, slept. And I was preaching, and I was live. Okay, you know the way you're live, you can't even, you know me, I'm a very good pastor. I will arrange your destiny. I will pause the message and help you. But we were live, I couldn't do anything. Then we will now finish service, you'll get on the corridor. The person will now be advising you. Hmm. Amen. Say to your neighbor, gravity. Gravity. Tell your neighbor for me, it takes force to take off. Listen to this. A rocket uses about 80% of its fuel for, just for takeoff. The rocket, 80% of its fuel. When they are planning everything, when they load the tank, 80% of the fuel is just for taking off. For most of us, you want to move to another level, you want to break new grounds, you want to do something you have not done before, you need to build energy. That's what Abraham was doing, even though the battle that was coming. It gets on my nerves when I see young people who are not getting ready for anything. They give you small opportunity. You, you fear the place. Victor, are you listening to me? They ask you to sing a song. Sing like it's experience. That is the only basis upon which you will get to experience. But if you keep thinking oh, it's just a midweek service, uh, it's just worship after the message, uh, they just told me to back out. You may back up. You are never going to get there. David was just a shepherd boy. His brother told him when he was to fight Goliath. He said, with whom have you left those few sheep? It was with those few sheep that somebody now described is a valiant warrior, is fine in business, is a wonderful worshiper. The Lord is with him. All they said was look for somebody who knows how to play. Look at his description. He was overqualified for the job. Hey, but he was not getting ready to be a music player. He was getting ready to be a king. It's not about your location. It's about your vision, your destination. What are you getting ready for? Let me move on and talk about resistance. Resistance. Resistance now is external factors 
that are working against you. External factors that are working against you. And it is at this point that we start talking about competition. Okay, you've got always, always to, I have to remember, you are not the only one who wants it. Okay, throughout the history of mankind till date, the strongest man is king. But with the advancement of civilization, warfare gave way to competition. Man evolved from using physical force to using strategic advantage. Are you getting this? We are still in warfare nonetheless, but we don't call it warfare anymore because people don't die. But it is strategic advantage. If it is you against the world, you need to understand. Because you represent God and because you are about God's mandate, you ought to be in charge. Everybody listening to me needs to go back to work and get angry. If a non-believer is your boss, it's your fault. Hello? I said, if an unbeliever is your boss, it's your fault. Because you have what it takes to dominate. The easiest way to make sure an unbeliever is not your boss is to start your own business. If you are listening to me right now and you don't have a dream to start anything, you are part of the problem of this nation. Because I saw so many Christians who don't want to take responsibility for anything. You want it to be, and that's why people are trying to run away. The ones that just want to run away. You want a country that works and you don't want to make it happen. And if you're not careful, you will get there and I don't want to mention names. There are places in countries that they say when you get there, they blindfold you and you hear what's happening there. You will think you're in Lagos. In a quick matter to be precise. When you open your eyes, you see, oh, it's my people. Are we getting this? You've got to take responsibility. When are you going to start something? Okay, even if you don't start it, be the one in charge. Be a prince in Egypt. Not a prince in church. And that's why I was jostling, I was jostling for position. You told me, I'm, I'm a HOD. You, you know when you came? I came. Well, Paul said, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where no other person has. I don't want to build on anybody's foundation. He said ambition. He didn't say direction. He didn't say purpose. He didn't say God's instruction. It's an innate desire to honor God with achievement. So when you now begin to talk about competition and it is a fellow believer, you need to understand that the person is a brother doesn't mean the person should step down for you. Because the world deserves the best of us. That is where competition comes in. Competition is not warfare. Warfare is the elimination of opposition. Competition is giving people the opportunity to pick the best of two or more alternatives. That's the kind of warfare I'm talking about. That's the kind of warfare I'm talking about. You can ask these guys, they know. Leading worship in this church is not automatic. And it's not democratic. The microphone is never going to go around. Because every time we come to church, our destiny is at stake. Do you want the best worship leader to lead you in worship? Answer me. Or do you want just the next person? I'm telling you the truth. It's possible to come in a service and sick is healed. Because when God inhabits the word praises of his people, it begins to touch us, it begins to heal us, it begins to instruct us. Why should we all come to church and watch one person to encourage the person? So everybody, all the good singers, just, let's just encourage him. Let's just encourage her. So as the worship is going on, we are singing a song by ourselves. The person is not leading us, we are going together. But the person is called a worship leader. What does that mean? There is dimension of worship you know and you do more than we do. So you take us where you are being. But if you don't go anywhere during the week, we are all stuck together on Sunday. That's the truth. I've been working on this message all week and I'm not preaching it for the first time and I've been awake this morning since 3 a.m. It's work. But let me tell you the difference. It's not for Hill City. It's not for now. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I'm still going to preach this message. Every time I preach it, it's a riaza for a better time. That's the truth. Why should I preach it to 200 when I can preach it to 20 million? The same message. Are you here this morning? So you're not the only one who wants it. You're not the only one who wants to make it. You're not the only one who wants to succeed. Other people are interested. The sister wants the best man. So if you're going to be the man, you've got to be willing to compete. And this time around, he's not tearing people's shit. Listen, anytime anybody fights in public over a relationship, the person has failed already. So can you imagine? She snatched my boyfriend. They don't snatch people. People make conscious decisions what to do with their lives. It's either you fell in love with a goat who does not understand commitment. It's not the girl that snatched your husband. It's your husband that is a fool. 
And it's your fault that you married a fool in the first place. Take responsibility. Abigail did. She told David, don't mind him. Oh. He's a foolish man. <laughs> she owned it. See, I'm not going down with this ship. I'm going to do something about it. He's a foolish man. Oh. Even his name is foolishness. But you are a man after God's heart. Don't let a foolish man cause you to spill blood. Abba. Eh? And she did, it, she did it with an attitude. She left impression. So much that when David heard that the fool had died, the first thing he said, mm, get me that girl. She's not just useful for stopping trouble. I want her in my life. Do you understand what I'm saying? The way you are dealing, the way you are doing things right now is determining who wants you. Personally told that story. She had a conflict with somebody and she felt by conflicting with the person, she has offended even the person's mother. So she went to apologize to the mother on her two knees. I went there to buy bread. <laughs> As I was buying the bread, she came. She didn't even wait for me to go. She was like, Mommy, eh, I'm so sorry. Eh? And she knelt down. Mommy, I'm happy. I just stood there. I said, ah, ah, whose damn cell is this? <laughs> In this campus, there are still people like this? Is that not like the story of Boaz and Ruth? Yes. As she was gleaning behind the reapers, I said, who's damn cell? This one is different. Do you understand? Don't just say somebody took, they didn't take your husband. You lost your husband. They are two different. They, nobody took your job. Say, the moment he came to our office, your guy just stopped looking at some of us every time. Nice. For sure, for sure. For sure, he's better than you. He's more competent. And he's just 20 years old. Is it because he has a foreign degree? No, they didn't teach them. They said, he didn't buy a handout. <laughs> he went for lectures. He was educated. He is solving problems. Are you saying just because it's privileged? No, you can buy books. You can read books. You can take online courses. They are free of charge. Not your neighbor. Tell the person that you can do something about it. See, listen, it's warfare. Are you getting this? It's warfare. There's nothing as terrible as when a believer is oblivious of the battle going on. I was not the only guy. There were other guys. There were some I helped her to disqualify them just by being a friend and by giving her advice. So, ah, that guy, ah, he has plans for you and it's an evil plan. Say, how do you know? If this one happens, if that one happens, this is the way he will respond. And then she's, ah, do you know that that was what happened? Say, I told you. <laughs> I told you. Yeah, we die here. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. It's warfare. Israel was just telling me something now. During, after the first service, he went to a church. He said, I love their music. And as I was listening to the music, I said to myself, I'm going to play in this church. Abby. And he plays bass in that church now. If you won't take it, it won't give you. And there's somebody there already. I'm changing the course of this series now. Going forward, I'm going to be showing you the force you have to use in competition. And it's intangible. The two of us can be fighting and nobody knows we are fighting. So you don't even know that. In fact, sometimes you don't know who you are fighting with. But you just know, I'm not the only one interested, but I'm going to be the person picked. I want it. I'm going to get it. Not how I didn't get Don't cry like, what's the name of Herb? So I want Nabo's vineyard, and he did not give it to me. You didn't give him an offer he couldn't refuse. Yes. Amen. Jezebel said what? Chill. How can you be the king, and you want something, and you don't get it? Chill. Nabot, give him your vineyard. No. Okay. I know what to do. What happened eventually? This one is about God's agenda. Don't go and use that style for everything in your life. But just know that if something is for you, you have put your foot there, there is peace. You know, this is my space. This is my... You know, you get to an organization, you know. When they got to Samaria, God would have us here. But there was Simon the sorcerer. There are people there who are already oppressing the people who are leading them astray. You know. I'm telling you the truth. So you get there, you know. Listen, I'm going to win this battle. Amen. I'm going to win this battle. It leads, leads me to what I call the fifth law of victory. The fifth law of victory. When the force within you is greater than the forces against you, your victory is inevitable. I'll write it down. When the force within you is greater than the forces against you, your victory is inevitable. That's my paraphrase of something my pastor said years ago. He said, where two powers meet, the lesser power bows. 
Where two powers meet, the lesser power bows. And please, you need to, especially believers, listen. Some of them will go to Babalawa, they will do, and then you will just wake up, you don't read your Bible, and you're just going there with common sense. No, 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 you've got to go and take it by force. Amen? Take it by force. Because you know, once my force, and I'm talking to you, whether it involves you as a non, with a non-believer, or it involves you and a fellow believer, when the force within you is greater than the force against you, your victory is inevitable. Hallelujah. First John chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Let me explain something because somebody is still having issues. Pastor Shagun, but the person is a fellow believer. Listen, if the person is sensitive to the Holy Spirit, it cannot be our places at the same time. So one person is illegal. So when the Bible says, one that is in you is greater than this that is in the world, it, it is talking about the Holy Spirit. If you are there by the leading of the Holy Spirit, if you are there by divine direction, you are sure you know. I'll give you an example of how that has happened to us in this church. When we're going to move to Adegoega Hall, there was another church using it. Okay? There was another church using it. And um, I think we were paying like 50000 or something. The hall used to go for 100,000. And because of these guys, it dropped to 50,000. Now, I pastored a church that was using the hall and we were paying 100,000. And even though we were paying 100,000, we were very responsible. We built a cordial relation. Because listen to me, the transaction does not end with money. It's a mistake a lot of people make. Beyond the money you are paying, there's got to be relationship. So when we started having issues, and I knew that my pastor's church, where I was resident pastor then, had moved away from that place. I told my pastor, I said, I'm wondering, since church has left Maryland um, then, can Hill City go to Adigo Ega Hall? He said, Shakira, why not? What if he said, no, I'm not going? That's how you know your place. Okay? It's better to be at peace than to be right. Loyalty trumps competence. Anytime, any day. It's one of those, these are things we fight with. If you had said, Shege, no, I don't want you there. That's it. I, but it's not fair now. His own church is not there anymore. It's my father. My Bible says, obey so that you may live long. Honor your father so that you may live long. These are fundamental principles. He said, Shege, go ahead, take the place. I called the people. I said, do you, are you guys vacant? They said on the phone, Pastor, there's another church using the place. But if you want it, we would rather have you there than the other church. We are serving the same God. But there must be a way they were conducting their affairs that made them less favorable to me. It's part of the force I'm talking about. I said, how much are they paying? I said, I'm like 50,000 or something. Pastor, but you will pay 60,000. Now, listen to this. I was coming from a hall where I was paying 200,000 per week for a 120 seater hall and they're offering me 400 seater for 60,000. What would you do? Ah, but it's not fair. You are kicking another church out. They said the church has been owing now for like three or four months. They don't pay regularly. Maybe that's not their level. I'm not going to jeopardize my mission for another believer who is doing things out of time. Because some of you just play Mr. Nice Guy. Ah, ah, she's dating uh, Felix. Ah, we are brothers in the same church. Ah, no. Test first. Give her the opportunity to decide between you and Felix. Let her not stand before God and say, God, the, the man you gave me. God, God will say, no, no. Ebube came. You chose Felix over Ebube. <laughs> it's your decision. Listen, until they walk down the aisle and they exchange vows. Survival of the fittest. Pastor Shegun said so. Nobody claims any territory. Amen. Amen. Until they walk down the aisle and he puts a ring on it and sign the dotted lines. Ask her. Yes. Some of the sisters that have been broken hearted is because somebody claimed territory and you played along. And then last when the boss has gone, the person left you at bus stop. So can you imagine? You know, BRT came, I said no. Uber came, I said no. I was waiting with you. Now you have left me. Amen. You know it's not a conviction if it's not tested. Yes. Bible said even Abraham, the father of faith, God tested the faith of Abraham. That's your love. Let it be tested. So when she says, um, Felix said that she come on a date, allow her to go. 
Don't pick fight with friends. Don't come to pitch eggs. So I don't understand. Everybody knows in this church that it's me and Fulola that are together. Why is that, brother? Let him talk now. Let your conviction be tested. Because if it is not tested, it cannot be trusted. Some of the cars you drive, you know the kind of tests they put them through? They play out every scenario they can, that can happen in real life. They put the car through it. It's only in Nigeria we advertise more than we engineer. The engineer, by the time they give you 10 years warranty on a car, it's not just because they want to sell. Listen, when you advertise a bad product, you make it, make it fail faster. By the time they're telling you 10 years warranty because they know. I can't remember which edition of the Mercedes-Benz. They've tested it so much. They said, under no circumstance will it have an accident and end on his back. Because of the way they engineered it. No matter how many times it's somersault, it's always going to land on his four tires. Engineering. Engineer your life like that. So that when somebody comes to test your babe. Amen. The law of victory. When the force within you is greater than the forces against you, your victory is inevitable. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 to 32. It says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If I don't have it, it is not because God does not want to give me. He has given me his most important possession. Why will he hold back anything? Hallelujah. 